Wonderful. So thank you so much for joining us today for Rice First's second ever webinar. My name is David Hasso, and I am a content developer with Rice First. I will be moderating today's conversation. Dima Alharti, a Rice First Summer Fellow, will also be supporting the webinar today, specifically with the Q&A at the end. We have a very special guest today. Tanisha Agaramonte from the Department of Commerce's Civil Rights Division is joining us for a conversation on careers in the public sector. Our goal with this webinar is to facilitate a transition from the campus to the workplace. I will go ahead and introduce Tanisha in a second, but before that, I'd like to give you all a bit of background on Rice First. Rice First is a nonprofit founded in 2018. We are a committed team of first-gen students and professionals working to develop a comprehensive online platform that empowers first-gen low-income students and professionals. You often hear us uh, refer to first-gen low-income as FIGLI. The platform and community is built for and by FIGLI students with the goal to be a one-stop destination for all FIGLI students and professionals to turn to for information, advice, and support. We bring curated and FIGLI related career resources to students in the US. We love connecting with the FIGLI community. So if you'd like to stay up to date with us, connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Don't worry about finding the links on our, to our sites. They will be included in a post webinar survey that we send out after the webinar is over. Also, one last thing, as a quick reminder, this session is being recorded. So you will be able to view the recording on our YouTube channel a few days after the webinar ends. Wonderful. So before we get started, uh, before I introduce our guests, I'd like to get an understanding of who is joining us here today. So if y'all would do the pleasure of filling out this poll, I'll give you a couple of minutes to submit your responses. So let me go ahead and give you that time. Wonderful. Great. So I'd like to now introduce Tanisha. So Tanisha Gramonte is a highly regarded civil rights champion whose personal and professional mission is to advance equitable opportunities for all. She has 25 years of experience in the equal employment opportunity, diversity, civil rights, and human relations arenas as a civil servant, consultant, university instructor, and trainer and facilitator. Agaramonte was appointed to the Senior Executive Service, SES, in 2013. She currently serves as a director for the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Commerce. In this capacity, she serves as a principal advisor on equal employment opportunity and civil rights. She provides leadership, direction, and guidance on ensuring a model EEO workplace that is well postured to successfully achieve the DOC's mission. She received her bachelor's degree in mass communications from California State University, a word, and her master's degree in human relations from the University of Oklahoma. Wonderful. So, you know, to get started again, Tanisha, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've been looking forward to this webinar for some time now. And so I'd, like, I'd love to be able to get started by understanding your background. So to get started, where did you grow up and what was your That was over, you know, 20 years ago. So that's how I landed in this career field as a civil rights champion, um, making sure that everyone is working in an environment that's free from hostility, harassment, and that they have fair and equal opportunities to realize their full potential. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you again for sharing. And so now we kind of want to transition into, you know, what it is exactly that, that you do now, but I, specifically around first-gen low-income uh, professionals. So if you don't mind sharing, um, you know, can you tell us about the First Generation Professionals Initiative that you're a lead of? Absolutely. This is my baby, y'all. <laughs> so like four years ago, in my capacity as a, a civil rights director and EEO champion, as I said earlier, I am really charged with, and my staff, with looking at our agency's workforce demographic profile. So we look at like, you know, how many of this group, that group, and this group is represented in our workforce. And more important, well, equally important is not only who is represented, but where are they represented in the workforce? And we know across uh, the nation that as position, rank, title, scope, responsibility, as that increases, the diversity decreases. So the gender diversity, the racial diversity, the ethnicity diversity decreases 
as you go higher up in uh, the career ladder. So I have been thinking over the years when I'm asked to participate on panels, a lot of times people will ask me about my career journey and they'll say, what obstacles did you experience as a black female? What obstacles um, you know, did you experience in this journey? But it was either associated with being black or being a female. And a lot of times I found that when I gave examples of the obstacles that I experienced, a lot of it had some to do with those two identities, but really it had to do with the identity of being born in a low income household. Because I started thinking about all the ways in which I had been judged when I first came in the workplace. And I tell people all the time, we are judged by how we show up, right? How we look, how we speak and how we behave. And when I first came in the workforce, I really was insecure. I had a lot of self doubt. I wasn't yeah. comfortable in my speech. I was just overly obsessive about, wow, was that grammatically correct what I just said? Did I use the word in the proper context? Did I pronounce it appropriately? Um, and even though I was college educated, I still felt like there was a lot of vernacular and idiomatic expressions that I had, you know, I had grown up with. And so a lot of this language was very new to me, especially business language. I had not heard a lot of that growing up. So I was just had a lot of self doubt and insecurities. I didn't feel as if I belonged in the workplace. And even as I climbed the ladder, there were things like I wouldn't negotiate my salary. You know, I was just happy that I got the job and I felt like if I negotiated, they might rescind the offer. I didn't want to do that. Um, there were things I didn't understand about financial literacy. And so I, I don't think I was saving as much or investing. So it was all these little things that I was experiencing. So I started thinking to myself, huh, I wonder what role socioeconomic status plays in one's career trajectory. And then if it has that intersectionality of race and gender, which may compound it. So we set out to start the First Generation Professionals Initiative to see if that really was a thing. And uh, we actually uh, partnered with the US Census Bureau, which is a bureau under the Department of Commerce. They conducted a qualitative research. And guess what, Davi? You're supposed to say what? It turned <laughs> out there really is this thing, right? That um, you know, clearly a first generation college students, low income experience challenges, not only accessing the college, but navigating the campus, then it also stands to reason that as they transition to this new environment, this new context, that they may also experience challenges, especially when they have not had the role model of a parent or a caregiver who had already been in that uh, space before them. This is all very uncharted territory for us. We're trailblazers in this space. So the research proved, yes, there is this thing and we could benefit from a first generation professionals initiative. So we launched it and we've done some great things and I'm really excited about how much it has grown. Yeah, I know. Uh, I can just attest to that, right? Having a, a father from a uh, working a blue collar job, there's very little I can't come to him and ask him questions about even a resume, right? Like, how do you begin a resume? How do you reach out to employers? What are some best practices? Do you know anyone that you can connect me to? Um, these are just things that it's, it's you know, and to no one's fault. Well, at least not, not to my father's fault, of course. Right, absolutely. And, and it's, it's just another piece that has to be navigated when we're looking to for employment. And so I'm, I'm really, really, really glad that the efforts are being made to, to put together resources for first gen low income professionals, because that one person that you can reach out to for advice, whether it be, again, how to put together the documents that you need to submit for, for a, um, a job or, mm -hmm. you know, best practices to actually get a job mm -hmm. that can, that can change your life. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you mentioned it's not the fault of your father. I think, each and every one of us on this call, first generation professionals, we know we owe a debt of gratitude to our parents. They are hardworking individuals. They have instilled a strong work ethic um, in us. They made so many sacrifices so that we could have a better life than they had. 
It is just a fact, though, that they could not give us something they didn't have. If they had not worked in a professional workplace and had the opportunity to build a professional network and they have not had those lived experiences, that's something that they're unable to give us. It doesn't mean that they don't want the best for us, that they didn't encourage us, that they didn't motivate us, but it does mean that they couldn't give us something that they did not have. And so I think about my daughter I always give this example, Davi, my middle daughter, even though the first one is it's kind of similar, but the middle one, I specifically remember this. When she graduated from college and she was going after her first job, I remember her texting me and saying, hey, mom, I found this management training program that I want to apply for. And um, so what should I be thinking about? And her, her dad and I were going back and forth with our texts, like go online, look up their stock portfolio information, look up their training programs, look at this, look at that, um, their core values, their mission statement, blah, blah, blah. So we did all that with her to help her prepare. Uh, she went on the interview. And even when she went on the interview, I remember saying, go in my closet, get the power suit, wear these stockings, wear this jewelry, take an attache case, make sure you print your resume on good paper and all this. And the day that she received her offer letter, she texts us and she attached it. And I remember leaning back and going, wow. My 22-year-old daughter would have blown my 22-year-old self out of the water just because she was so much more prepared than I would have been at that age. Just she would have been seen as so much more polished than I would have at 22. Um, and so why this professional First Generation Professionals Initiative is so important is because while we still want to give Carmen is her name, while we still want to give the Carmens of the world an opportunity, because I'm sure she really was competitive in her interview and she did a great job. I'm also thinking about the other children who potentially have parents that work in retail, you know, Popeyes, Walmart, something like that, who couldn't give that advice that we gave to Carmen. But should they be ruled out? Can we also give them an opportunity to be competitive, right? So that's why we're trying to reach first-gen college students now, because I want to make sure that they're just as competitive and that they're not counted out, because I know they have a lot of potential and I know they have valuable traits to bring to the workforce, and I want to level that playing field for them. That's great. And I know, um, you know, this came up in our offline conversation, but about the, the different needs of resources, right, between the, um, you know, 10 or 15 years before to for first and low income students and or professionals and versus now, right? Now we, we have the ability to be really well connected. And, you know, we have, again, also like resources like Rice First that want to be one stop shop. So students can just turn to one website and find all of the, res the resources that they need. Um, there are different needs. There are different needs, right? And it's one of the things that has to be understood better about what is it that can be offered to those, you know, first and low income professionals now who um, are five, 10 years into their jobs or, or can we provide, can we make a way for them to get better jobs maybe to better support their families, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. So I love that. And, and I think that's, that's a wonderful initiative. I personally didn't know about this initiative before getting to know you. Um, and being introduced to you, but I, I'm so glad that, that it is a reality that's becoming. Yes, I love it. And, and again, shout out to Rise First because we actually hunted you guys down, right? So I have two brilliant interns this summary, Hillary Shaw and Evelyn Camacho, <laughs> who are helping me. They're both first generation college students. And we were looking through the websites um, and we found yours and it was like, let's connect with them because it makes more sense to collaborate and partner where we can because each one teaches one, you know, we're all force multipliers and we're all working in the same space to help not only first gen low income students, but like you said, also first generation professionals. So I'm so excited about this collaboration. Wonderful. I mean, when we are obviously excited as well and, um, I'm just really excited about the opportunities that exist, again, to spread the word, to show the resources and, and props to our marketing, uh, you know, team at Rice First for being able to put us out there so that people could find us and the web development team as well. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. 
So one of the next questions that, that I have for you are, are what kind of, and you might uh, maybe have a sense of this, but what kind of entry level jobs exist in the public sector? So let's say I'm a, I'm a college student uh, graduating and I'm looking to get into the public sector. How would you recommend someone start and what opportunities are there for entry level jobs in, in the government? In the public sector. So let me first say this. There are entry level jobs across all occupations that you can think of in terms of any of the work that a federal agency would do. So law enforcement, health care, uh, taking care of our veterans, ensuring that our nation's heroes are provided with access to medical uh, treatment, uh, burial benefits, uh, school benefits, trying to think education, Department of Education. Uh, so you got Homeland Security. Uh, I'm trying to think off the cuff, Debbie, but there's all types of federal agencies, IRS, you know, Department of Treasury, which IRS falls under Social Security. Uh, Social Security. So there are all type of jobs that you can think of. And I would say the best way to find more about uh, entry level positions into the federal government is to go on to the Office of Personnel Management's website. And when you go on their website, look for information on their Pathways Program. And under their Pathways Program, you will find out about three different ways that college students can work for the government. And one is just as a regular intern uh, program. So many times over the summer at different point, parts through the year, federal government agencies hire uh, college students through that internship program. They also hire recent college graduates. So it's a whole nother program under the pathways for recent college graduates. So if you're within two years of uh, graduating from college, you can be hired under that program. Then they have a presidential management fellows program. That's for college students who are in grad school. And if you're hired through that program, and it's very competitive, if you're hired through that program, you actually come into a position with guaranteed promotion potential. And that is awesome. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about federal jobs, I would invite you to attend. I'm looking at my piece of paper. Next week, August 5th, we actually will have a webinar sponsored by the Office of Personnel Management's PMF program from two to three. Uh, there's also another hour, I don't know if it's before or after, but we'll get that message to you to learn about all three of those programs that I just mentioned. Um, and we need you. The reality is that uh, I also started this first generation professional initiatives program because we know there's a lot of recruitment bias. And so let me jump into four things real quick. David, can I do that? Of oh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so we identified there are certain individual obstacles that first-gen professionals experience and also some institutional barriers. One of the institutional barriers may be around recruitment bias, right? Um, I shared with you all my journey and I know that you all have some powerful journeys. If someone were to look at my resume when I graduated from undergrad, what they would see is seven years it took me to get an undergrad degree. They would see about a 20 odd part-time jobs that I worked so that I could uh, fit them around my college schedule. But no really impressive jobs, but they were jobs that gave me the money to pay for school, right? And then they'd see a mediocre GPA. Now, mind you, I know I'm on this end of the spectrum of first generation college students that there are some very high achieving because I've seen it. Some of my friends who are first gen college students, GPA way higher than me. They finished in four years. So we know that uh, there's a spectrum of first generation college students. But for me, if someone were to look at my resume and someone who had a similar journey to mine, working part time, going to school at night, they may not think that person represents the best and the brightest. And I know that. I've heard from hiring officials working in the jobs that I've worked, the positions, I'll hear them say, why do we need to uh, recruit? The Ivy League schools have already done that for us. They've already found the best and the brightest, the creme de la creme. So if there is a hiring official who has that bias or perception that only Ivy League school graduates represent the best and the brightest, or that you had to complete school within four years, or you had to have this GPA, and in their mind, those are the only indicators of success. 
I am trying to shift that paradigm to say that, yes, I think those students are also very competitive and they add value, but let's not miss out on these people who had to take an alternate path because of their life circumstances. They also bring valuable traits, resiliency, grit, determination, and oh, by the way, they do have the degree and the experience. So how do we bring value to both sets of experience? So that's one thing. The other thing on the individual real quick, imposter syndrome. That's huge for a lot of first-gen professionals. Navigating the unwritten rules. If you didn't grow up at the knee of parents who spoke uh, around the dinner table about their experiences in the office, how they navigated political dynamics, how they handled a conflict with a colleague, how they supervised an employee. And you don't get to hear that business lexicon or the way things are done in the workplace. Your first exposure is when you go to the workplace. Mm -hmm. So now you have to learn these unwritten rules, the ones that are not explicitly stated, right? Also, networking may be a challenge. If you can't leverage your, your parents' professional network, so they're saying, oh, my daughter needs a job, my son needs a job for this coveted unpaid internship, whatever. So those are the things that we have determined may be obstacles, just some of them for first-gen professionals, and that's what we're trying to do workshops on to help with that. Financial literacy, we could talk about that a little bit in the Q&A. Yeah, no, and uh, all of this information, whatever um, you know, you're you're uh, putting out, we will definitely share through our networks as well. Um, and so we'll make sure that as many people can can also attend the webinars. It, it really is important, and those are the things that change, right? Like for me, it was uh, the only reason why I have a full time job now. It's because I was stayed connected with a nonprofit organization from back home, and I reached out to them once, and I said. Like I, I don't, I, I am interested in consulting and I want to go into consulting for at least the, the short term or who knows, maybe the long term, but I don't know anyone that I can reach out to. Do you know anyone by any chance that I could connect with? And then that led to a conversation that led to a full-time job that I have now, right? But that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have that one person. And this person also isn't, you know, they're not super well connected. They also come from, from a, a similar background, but it was just they were in a, in a point of their career mm -hmm. where they were now connected and then they could connect me. And so I think you see, um, you see lasting effects, right? So me yeah. as a personal low income student, I will go on to have uh, likely, you know, people that I can be, that I am connected to. And then I will pave the way for other students who are coming after me or other or professionals who need to be connected to someone, right? And so I think it has those effects, those long lasting effects where uh, one person helps the other. I agree. And you know, you make a great point and I have to share this story. I was speaking on the First Generation Professional Initiative at a conference a couple of years ago at Florida. There were over a thousand people in the audience. And this woman came up to me at the end and she was crying and she hugged me and she said, thank you. One, you just gave me a name for an identity that I knew I had some experiences, but I didn't have a name for it. And second, thank you for letting me know I'm not alone, that there's a tribe out there of people who have these same lived experiences. Then she went on to share with me that uh, she grew up in the foster care system, that at the age of nine, I think it was, both her mom and her dad died of meth overdose and that she grew up in the foster care system. She aged out. She went on to undergrad school. Then she went on to law school. Um, and she said it wasn't one of the top law schools. She didn't graduate in the top of her class. She came into the federal government because somebody was willing to take a chance on her. But the fact that she's a first generation, um, not only college graduate, but also attorney, that because she has those experiences, when she's looking at resumes, she does do that kind of comparison. She said, if I see someone and they have a lower GPA, but I see they work their way through school, then I put them on par with someone who didn't work that has a higher GPA. But having more of us in the workplace and having sensitivities and awareness of these issues definitely will help. Yeah. No, and, and I, that's part of it, right? That's it's mm -hmm. the understanding first, knowing and then being able to adjust and react to it. Absolutely. So wonderful. So we're running close to, you know, the end of this. Oh, it's 3.46. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
how time passes when you're having such a yeah. great conversation. Um, but so I want to touch on, you know, this last portion of, of, of the webinar before we go into the, the Q&A okay. um, of our attendees. But what is some, you know, just reflecting on your experiences, what, are, what is some advice that you have for first generation students and professionals? Maybe specifically, you know, what is something you wish you knew before beginning your, your professional career? So a couple of things. What I wish I knew in terms of imposter syndrome is that I'm capable of anything. And that's what I want all of you to know. If there's anyone who is listening to this call who is dealing with imposter syndrome, having self-doubt, feels incompetent, feels incapable, I want you to look at everything you have accomplished. The fact that you were sitting in a college class well, now you're not in a college class, you're probably at home doing something online. But the fact that you're enrolled in a college program speaks volumes about you, your character, your potential, your capabilities. And I want you to remember that and call back on that. Anytime you start doubting yourself, you are so incredibly great because you've already overcome the odds and the obstacles to be where you are. And remember that that will take you so much further in life. That's one. So I wish I had known that about myself and stopped uh, doubting myself and actually give myself a little pat on the back. Second, that it's important to network. And we already talked about that and that networking isn't disingenuous and it's not self-serving, but it is about creating an ecosystem around you because it is a give and take. So it's not like you're just taking from other people any job you have has interdependencies. You can't do it alone or there'd be a lot of unemployed people. We have to rely on other people in any job and we, they also have to rely on us. So networking is important. Um, third, financial literacy. I wish I knew more about money when I got my first job. There are so many stories about first generation professionals you know, getting this, what we think is like a huge salary because maybe we're the first in our family to make that kind of money that we make. And sometimes we feel like we got to go out and buy a lot of material things because it's our first time being able to afford it. Plus we feel like we should look and have things that's commensurate to show our success, you know, our status. We have to really think about our financial well-being and uh, manage our debt and focus more on savings and investments. Also, I think I wish I had known more about success guilt, that it really is a real thing. And that sometimes when you're the first in your family to make it and you make a certain amount of money, there may be some expectations on you from family members. And while you don't wanna abandon them, because it's important to maintain those family bonds, you must know that you have to set a strong foundation for yourself have some financial independence first to build a foundation because if not, it will crumble. And not only will you not be able to help yourself, you won't be able to help your family. So first you gotta make sure that you have that solid foundation. Get a financial planner, learn how to budget and how to save and invest is really important. That's huge. And I know just personally from being a part of Rice First, we've had uh, several conversations with those with those mentors within the organization about financial wellness, and um, I know that's a topic that's going to be coming up next month as well, uh, and so that's going to be really important. But thank you again for that information, for that advice, for that feedback. All points that are really important, and that um, it's it's easy to look over um, when you don't know that you should be paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really appreciate that, Tanisha. Absolutely. Uh, now we're going to step into the Q&A. And so in advance, I just want to apologize. We might not get to everyone's question, um, but you know, I'm going to try and you know, touch on some of the topics that maybe we haven't touched or some of the questions that are most uh, relevant to you know, the conversation. We're, we're sticking to this conversation around advice or for students. And so one question comes and asks, uh, you know, what advice do you have for students and or professionals who want to pursue a career in the nonprofit sector, but are conflicted pursuing an opportunity in the private space that may be more lucrative or offer higher pay. Uh, it's the age old question, right? We, I feel like a lot of first and low income students and professionals ask themselves this during college when they're looking for careers. Um, 
there's an opportunity here where I can I can go and support my community. I can go and do good for the for the for the better of society. Right. Pay as much, right? And I'm graduating with student loans. So what what advice can you offer there? My advice is you have to follow your purpose and your passion and where that leads you. And you have to be comfortable with that, right? Yeah. So if your purpose and your passion is to give back to your community, and again, a lot of first-gen college students, because they are the first, because they feel like they've been given this opportunity, um, and they get in college, and we learn so much when we're in college. We learn about economic inequalities. We learn about healthcare disparities. We learn about systemic racism and, and sexism and all these things. And then we get really pumped because now we understand to some degree some of the things that impacted our family. We learn about generational wealth and all this. So on one hand, we're struggling with, I'm the first. I got this degree. I'm supposed to go out and make money because that's all the sacrifices were made for me to do that. But then on the other hand, I feel like I've been given this gift of education and I'm supposed to give back. Um, I think you can do a couple of things. If you want to do nonprofit full time, pursue that. Follow your heart and do that. Just recognize that it's going to come with, um, you know, some financial constraints that you're not going to make as much money. Or you could pursue the money in the private sector with the Fortune 500 companies and volunteer your time. That's another option. Wonderful. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this relates to maybe your background and, and your work in the public sector, but the question is, what are some moments in your time working in the DNI space, government, that made you reconsider if this was the right type of work and or impact you wanted to contribute to? So, you know, working in the, the federal space um, and doing DNI work, I think is very important. There are times where you struggle and you wonder if you're making a difference. You wonder if this work is valued, not only by the people in the organizations that you work in, but the administration as a whole. Is it a priority for the administration? But at some point, I stopped worrying as much about whether or not it's a priority for any administration. Um, I've been in the government for 23 years, so I've worked through a number of administrations, Republican, Democrat. And with each administration, there were pros and cons. But in all administrations, for the most part, we had advancements in the area of diversity and inclusion, regardless of the party. But at some point, I stopped even focusing on the administration. I started focusing on what I could do within my sphere of influence. And the fact that I was able to do a first generation professionals initiative, I think is huge. It's helping at least a third of our American population. What I try to focus on more is when I think about people who don't want to come to the federal government because for whatever reason, I think we are missing out on the opportunity to bring the diversity into the federal government where we can make a difference. I really hope people consider public service because the government shapes our laws, our policies that impact our families, that impact our communities from an economic standpoint, from a health standpoint, from an education standpoint, of uh, safety, environmental, all these things. So we need as many people in our federal workspace who can help make our government better so that it is better for our communities. Okay. I hope that helped. Yeah. I guess I was trying to say, even if there are any constraints, you know, in terms of the work I do in diversity and inclusion, um, I keep my eye on the prize. And my eye on the prize is to make sure that we can recruit more diverse candidates into the government for the purposes I just said. Focus on leaving yeah. control. Right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, this next question asks, you know, the First Gen Professionals Initiative is so important. What is your end state vision for the initiative? Is there a private and public partnership that can be useful here? What would you think that private companies can do here to help here? Oh, yes. I would love to see a public-private partnership, especially in the area of paid internships because we have learned that unpaid internships are a huge obstacle for first-generation professionals, so, um, for first-generation low-income college students. 
Many have to work their way through school so they cannot afford to take unpaid internships, whereas some of their peers who come from middle class backgrounds or upper uh, middle class backgrounds are able to take these coveted unpaid internships with Fortune 500 companies. Potentially, it used to be congressional internships were unpaid, working with think tanks. These are all rich experiences that really help to enrich the resumes. And so if families are not given the opportunity for these rich, um, sort of fulfilling, coveted, unpaid internships, then they will not be as competitive, whether they're going into the private space or the federal government. So that's where I see public partner, uh, private partnerships really on that paid internship piece. That would be my first focus. In terms of an end goal for the uh, first generation professional internship program, what I see is us really focusing on three goals. One goal is to continue outreach with first generation low income students to make sure that we are preparing them for successful transition to the workforce. I want to catch them before they get there help build up their networks, help prepare them for interviews, for applying for jobs, um, managing that imposter syndrome, anything we can do to prepare them to come into the workplace. And then for the first generation professionals who are already in the workplace, making sure that we have employee resource groups uh, so that they can provide a sense of community and support for first generation professionals with people who have your shared experience also offer them tools, resources, webinars, and then similar to what Rise First has, um, creating a database. And this is something we're working together on so that they have tools and information um, on a website that's a one-stop shop to help. Wonderful. And so we're at four, but I was wondering if it's okay with you, Tanisha, to maybe go into four or five Oh, absolutely. Time. Uh, just we have the last couple uh, of questions and we should be good to go. This one is, 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 is a good question. Um, they said your work with first gen is crucial. Our systems have generated so much damage as a first gen immigrant woman who has navigated very difficult situations, including counterparts who have questioned my achievements. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you are dealing with the fact that a lot of upper management is white and they don't connect with our journey. Mm -hmm. How do you approach them? I'm particularly inter interested in learning how to do this when you work with someone directly. Also, my colleagues are white. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing on the institutional side, because what I have learned um, with the recent social unrest and racial tensions in our country is we have spent a lot of time and effort working on an individual level. So I'm trying to work on a systems level. So I'm trying to do a lot of awareness and education around unconscious biases. And so in particular, one that comes to mind is biases that we have along not only social class in terms of social class markers, but even when I think about accents, right? And I tell people, every American speaks accented English, whether it's Long Island, Bronx, you know, Brooklyn, it's Appalachian region, it's the Southern states, it is Midwest. We all speak with an accent. The difference is how those accents are perceived, right? And so if someone does not speak with a neutral, accent that may be associated with white, right? Stereotypically associated with white middle class, then somehow they are perceived to be inept, that they are not as educated. And there's studies that show this around social linguist uh, type studies. So I'm trying to raise awareness that if you hear someone and they're articulate, they're using the correct terms, it's grammatically correct uh, sentences and phrases, but they're speaking with an accent. What does that mean to you? How are you rating them? Are you giving them the same, you know, opportunities? And then make people aware of how we exclude people. So I talk about things like networking. If everybody at the job is going out after work, and this is where promotions are discussed, this is where detail assignments are discussed, but you're going to a very fancy restaurant that may be cost prohibitive for somebody like me coming from a faculty background where I can't afford to pay $15 for two shrimp. I can't afford the cab ride. I can't afford the parking there if I had to drive. These are those considerations that I want people thinking about. How are we being inclusive 
and mindful through our systems, through our policies and our practices to be included. But I want you to reach out to me personally and I can talk to you about how on an individual level to navigate um, in that space. But mostly I would just say it's, it's anything else we've talked about in terms of the cultural differences and, and nuances. Most important, I want you to feel as an immigrant educated woman that you belong in that space and don't allow anyone to make you feel as if you don't belong in that space. And so sometimes we have to show up in ways that make people see us, that make them hear our voice and not discount us. Thank you so much for that, Tanisha. Um, and so, you know, we, we're approaching the, the four or five mark, so I don't want to take up any more time, but so we are going to go ahead and end the webinar here. So again, thank you so much for joining us for the conversation and answering all of the questions that our attendees had. Also, thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing for first generation professionals and students. Know that Rice First is here to support with whatever we can. And to our attendees, thank you so much for attending. As a reminder, every attendee will be entered for a Rice First t-shirt raffle, uh, just for simply attending. Uh, awesome. Yeah, and so we are also sending out a post-webinar survey. survey. Uh, so if you fill it out, you'll get a second entry into the raffle. So Ooh. please fill it out. We really appreciate all of the feedback, and that's how we can continue to improve and change our webinar structure uh, and everything that, that ties along to that. Lastly, we are also currently working on improving our financial wellness resources on the page for Rise First, and we'd love to chat with members of the community who are either rising sophomores, juniors, seniors, or who have graduated within the past one to three years. So if you or anyone you know is interested in sharing your experiences with, with financial wellness, we would love to listen to your experience and to learn of your concerns. Uh, well, on the post-webinar survey, there's an option to submit your email. So submit your email and your class year or your uh, professional experience, and then we'll be reaching out to you. And also follow us on our social media channels and stay connected. So once again, thank you so much, Tanisha. It's been a wonderful opportunity to chat with you, both and offline and online. Just thank you so much for everything that you've shared and just for just being real and authentic. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. Muchas gracias por todo. Tengo un buen día. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful day, rest of your week, and a wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.